winning business solutions. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, not really core, core design thinking as such, but uh, how is it applicable and how can it be used in winning, winning uh, Yeah. Yeah. Can uh, others mute themselves, please, if possible? Yeah, I've muted, I've muted the person. Thank you. Uh, so uh, when one talks about innovation, uh, or if I now were to ask you to kind of close your eyes for a minute and think about some innovative stuff, what comes to your mind? Can you write down what comes to your mind in the chat window? Let's see what people think innovative stuff is all about. So if you can type out what comes to your mind when I say think of something, something innovative, what comes to your mind? Let's have a quick uh, in the chat window. Creativity, okay. Others, what comes to your mind when I tell you to think of something that is innovative? If I were to tell you something that is something that's some innovate, think about some innovative stuff. What does it, what comes to your mind? Creativity, unique, future, forward looking, technology. Hello, everybody. Yes. Can I present you my, my project? I'm Isabel from Kigali, Rwanda. An agripreneur. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but... Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. So my project is organic garlic production and supplement. PV Maestro, organic garlic production and supplement. Problem, uh, so, problem well solving. Hello. Uh, according to NAEB, Na National Agriculture Export Development Board, garlic production in Rwanda is insufficient. Uh, is there some miscommunication there, looks like? Hello, can I continue? Yes, you may continue. Lela? Yeah. Yes, uh, you may continue. So, sorry about that. Well, I think they are in the wrong room. Okay. So, so yeah, I would like some others also to type in what comes to your mind when you think, when I tell you to think of something, some innovative stuff. Others, uh, three, four people have typed in. Uh, maybe some others can also type in their responses. Technology. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's 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 go ahead. Uh, so generally, when I ask this question, uh, generally what comes out is some people talk about, say, an iPhone. Somebody says uh, something to do with augmented reality, Google Glasses, or somebody talks about some the self-driving vehicles, uh, somebody talks about some space technology and things like that. So generally I have kind of uh, felt that people relate innovation to physical products and something to do with high technology. That's generally, I mean, 95% of the people would respond uh, by saying innovation, by associating innovation with some physical product or something to do with high technology. Uh, that's when the question comes to my mind that is innovation only about some fancy products and something to do with fancy high technology? Uh, can entrepreneurs uh, not explore something else also and still bring in innovation and build winning business solutions? Now that's where uh, the thought of creating unique business models comes in. I mean, how do you structure your business? How do you structure your business uniquely? How do you structure your business differently? 
so that you can create something unique in the market, something differentiated in the market. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, unique business models today. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm going to share some of my research over the past say, uh, 12 to 15 years in uh, trying to understand how some small little startups have actually uh, disrupted the market and have made much larger competitors kind of redundant in the longer run. So, and what are some points that we can learn from there? And uh, if we can learn from there, can we use them when we start our small startups? That's the agenda for the day. So uh, how does, uh, so from, I will talk about nine, 10 examples. And from each of these examples, can we draw out some specific underlying principle on which that particular business model was based upon or that particular entrepreneur uh, based his business model? And is there anything to learn for us? And can we apply the same to some of the ideas that we are working on? So I hope uh, by the end of uh, the next one hour or so, you will have got some seven, eight different principles on, these, on which one can create unique and sustainable business models. So let me start with the first one. Uh, first one uh, is what I call as uh, double whammy. Uh, instead of trying to explain what it means, I will take an example. Uh, this person called Javed Habib uh, is a celebrity hairstylist uh, in India. God. By celebrity hairstylist, I mean that in the 90s- So next time, in case you have trouble, the first step you can do is on cross talk cross connection. Okay, can I continue? Hello. Okay. You can continue. Yeah, I will continue. Uh, so uh, I was talking about this individual called Javed Habib, a celebrity hairstylist. In the 1990s, his claim to fame was that uh, most of his clients would be film stars from India, uh, cricket stars, various sports stars from India. And that's how he became famous. And uh, by the early 2000s, uh, his ambitions obviously grew. But the limitation was that almost all of his business came from his personal skill. Now, he obviously wanted to expand, but when it depends on your personal skill, you only have 24 hours and seven days a week. So how can you maximize those was the question that he faced. So somewhere around 2004 or 2005, he started a training academy to train hairstylists, which means uh, people who wanted to learn hairstyling paid him a fee to learn hairstyling at his academy. And on the other side, after about a year and year or two, he started a franchised out chain of salons called Hair Expresso. That means on one side, he started his training academy and a year later, he started a chain of franchised out salons called Hair Expresso under the brand Hair Expresso. And uh, now when one goes to the Hair Expresso salons to have a haircut, uh, 90 to 95 percent of the times the hairstylists are student interns from his own academy so if you look at this kind of business the way he has started his business is such that he is getting paid from both sides of the value chain which means at the back side his students are paying him to get trained as hairstylists and at the front end, when the, consume, the consumers are paying him at his Air Expresso salons. But most of the staff that he is using there is student interns, which means he is able to economize on the costs big time. And because of that, he was able to open up that market of hairstyling, franchised out hairstyling salons uh, to such an extent uh, in India back then that he, his standard haircut would cost almost half of a comparable haircut in a comparable quality in a, at a competitor's place. Now, if you analyze this whole model, he has actually created 
revenue streams from both sides of the value chain from the supply side as well as the as from the demand side that means from the supplier side as well as from the consumer side from the supply side it is the students who are paying him and from the demand side it is the consumers who are paying him now can you use this kind of a uh, a model somewhere that you are trying to build a business in if you are able to do it you will be able to economize your costs and give out possibly the same quality but at a much lower cost another example is a, a language learning app called duolingo if you go on the google store or the uh, apple play store you will find this app called duolingo you can download it it's a nice cool uh, uh, language learning app wherein uh, you get different tutorials in the form of nice little animations and nice little games so which means if you want to learn a foreign language download that app and you keep on playing with it that means uh, you keep on translating the words that they give you you keep on translating the sentences that they give you and then they tell you whether you're right or wrong or x y z now uh, at the back side duolingo is actually a translation based company is a, is a translation company how they operate is simple suppose one of you is uh, representing an african company and wants to enter the indian market so the first one of the first tasks that you would have to do is get your documents translated into some local indian languages english or hindi or some other languages right so su suppose i am duolingo you come to me for doing that translation job and uh, what i do is i break down your document into small little words small little bits small little sentences etc and create nice animations around it nice you know nice tutorials around it and i push those tutorials down through the app store or the google play store uh, where hundreds of thousands of people who possibly want to learn your language would download that app and keep on playing with it what does playing with it mean they actually are doing the translations of those small little words and sentences that i have taken from your document which means hundreds of thousands of people are actually doing the translation on my behalf and at the back end i have an intelligent algorithm which picks up the best translations from various people who are doing the translations and it stitches the document together and i give it to my customer at the back end who is paying me and at the front end it's a kind of a freemium model freemium model meaning that the first 6 7 levels that you play with are free and then after that the app starts monetizing your presence in the sense that they either push in some in app videos or they make you pay for the content that is being provided so as you graduate up the levels your proficiency in the language gets better and the level of translation that i get that is duolingo gets gets better and the more the satisfaction for the customer on the other side so basically both javed habib with hair express salons and duolingo have used this principle of double whammy double whammy meaning making money from both ends of the value chain now where can one use this kind of a model this model can be used if you are you are operating in a space where if your if there is any scope for some training activity for imparting some skill to people and if there is a sufficiently large demand for that skill then you can actually at the back end start a training academy and at the front end you can cater to customers as well so uh, think how you can structure your business in this fashion uh, mind you there is no product innovation there is no great technology used here it is just the way you structure your business in a smart manner so that's uh, point number 1 from me uh, next point number 2 is uh, this is an interesting story of uh, two boys from a premier institution in india by the name it's called iit indian institute of technology at uh, in delhi delhi happens to be the uh, capital of india so these two boys somewhere in 2007 2008 uh, figured out that uh, you know uh, on an average uh, uh, in a class classroom people take notes of whatever the faculty or the professor is teaching 
and uh, these notes are generally taken by the three or four most sincere students in the class and the rest of the class photocopies their notes and just before the exam they go through those notes and clear those exams that's a general pattern you'll find in most universities 10% of the students very sincerely take the notes rest of the 90% uh, take photocopies of those notes and clear their exams now this trend means that there is a lot of photocopying of notes happening this is a 10 12 year old story uh, today we don't do photocopying but we just take a picture on a mobile and scan it but back then people used to do a lot of xeroxing a lot of photocopying so these boys discovered that you know they did some research and figured out that uh, on an average an indian student uh, does photocopying worth about 200 rupees that's indian currency uh, in one semester that means a semester of six months on an average a student spends about 200 rupees uh, on xeroxing which means there are two semesters in a year so on an average they spend about 400 rupees per semester uh, per year 400 rupees would roughly translate to about uh, six six and a half dollars uh, us dollars all right now uh, when they uh, did this mathematics uh, they further found out that on an average in an Indian university uh, across the country on an average close to about 2 million students pass out of Indian universities every single year. Now if you do the math 2 million into $6 which is $12 million market only from one year of the university pass out. So that way a university has four simultaneous batches of students running uh, every year, which means it is a 48 million US dollar market of photocopying only from the student population. Now, when they studied this market, they realized that it is a completely fragmented market in the sense that there are multiple photocopying vendors all around, but they are all unconnected to each other. So these guys uh, thought of creating a platform to bring them all together. And over a weekend, they actually created a site, a website, and called it focutcopy.com. Uh, translated into English, this means freecopy.com. This focut is a Hindi word. Translated, it means free. So freecopy.com. Now, what they did after that was uh, they went and tied up with around their institution, IIT Delhi, uh, they went around and tied up with about 10 or 12 photocopying vendors uh, and said uh, that from tomorrow onwards, any student who comes to you for photocopying, do not charge a single penny less than what you used to till yesterday. Charge the student exactly what you used to charge till yesterday. No concessions. Only thing is that what you do is along with 20 Xerox copies that the student buys for every 20 photocopies that the student takes from you, give them one of our cards, one of our scratch cards. That is, they had created a nice little scratch card with their branding and a scratch card, as you know, is like, uh, you know, you used to get those cards with, with a silver uh, uh, coating on it. And if you rubbed off the silver coating, there would be a 10 or a 12 digit number uh, underneath which appeared. And on the card, there were very clear instructions written that uh, take this number and punch it and feed it into our website, this forgotcopy.com website, and click enter. And the website would generate an, a discountable, encashable discount coupon, uh, which would generate, which the website would generate. And these discount coupons would be honored at some of the affiliates that these people had joined up with, like some coffee shops in and around Delhi, some fast food joints in Delhi, in that city, which meant that if the student took that discount coupon of 20 rupees for one, one bunch of 20 copies, he or she would get a, an equivalent discount of 20 rupees on everything that it, they spend the money on, which meant that if the students encash their discount coupon, their photocopying expenses would be absolutely free. They would pay to the photocopying vendor, 
but when they used the discount coupon and spent and went to one of these affiliates like the coffee shops etc they would get an equivalent discount which meant that this whole photocopying for the student would actually be free there's absolutely no catch in this whole uh, process now in effect uh, what did these guys do my question to you is was there even a product that they created there was no product was there something high technology that was used no this was a pure purely a restructuring of the market and creating a very unique business model and actually giving business to the photocopying vendors as well as the affiliates the cafe the coffee shops etc and thus creating a win win situation and obviously making money for themselves as well so this is what typically is called as aggregating competitors on a platform uh, now uh, once these the, these two boys their website became popular a lot of footfalls used to come on the website so at that time they started banner advertisements on the website also so this so they generated another revenue stream for themselves and a third revenue stream very interestingly uh, they generated was uh, they went to these same photocopying vendors asked them how much do you buy your paper for the white paper on which photocopying is done how much do you buy it for so they said maybe a uh, dollar for 1000 uh, pages Uh, then they said okay if you're paying a dollar for 1000 pages uh, we will charge you 0.8 dollars for 1000 pages will you buy from us if somebody uh, without any compromise in quality uh, anybody receiving something of the same quality at a cheaper price would obviously not refuse it now how were they able to give it at a lower price they created another uh, revenue stream by going around to local shops in the vicinity and asking them for advertisements and their advertisements would be printed at the bottom of that white page or watermarked along the white page so that they would not interfere with the xeroxing uh, with the content of the page and the advertisers would pay them some money which they used to subsidize the cost of the paper for the xerox for the photocopying vendors that way they started another uh, third revenue stream uh, from without a product i i want to emphasize the fact that they don't have a product themselves but they have a successful business model they have a win win business model by win win i mean everybody involved in that ecosystem in that in that environment wins the uh, the uh, coffee shops and the affiliates at the back end win because they get an additional customer at a probably a much lower acquisition cost second uh, the photocopying uh, vendors also win because imagine in a locality suppose there are 20 vendors and these boys tie up only with 10 or 12 vendors not all 20 because they these 10 or 12 vendors are tied up with this pocketcopy.com students know that here we can get a discount we can get those uh, incashable discount coupons the most almost all the crowd student crowd in that locality would flock to these 10 or 12 and not to the other 8 or 8 or 10 left left uh, the other ones which means these 10 or 12 vendors get additional revenue so they are happy in the process and uh, focus copy boys these two boys also make money in the form of commission from these coffee shops and other places to which the discountable discount and cashable discount coupons are connected with so it's a total win win situation in this process so remember how you can create win win situations in the uh, in the environment that you are operating in how all the stakeholders involved can can benefit from what you do because if you create win lose situations these these business models will not survive for too long because sometime somebody wins for the uh, for somebody to win somebody has to lose these kinds of things do not remain sustainable in the long run whereas the business models where all the stakeholders win in every situation those are the ones which will remain sustainable in the long run uh, let's go to the next one uh, uh, let me talk about uh, 
uh, all of you would be familiar with Uber and Airbnb and those kinds of companies, right? Uh, how did Uber start, start its business? Well, the famous story goes that one of the founders was stuck somewhere in the rain and could not find a cab, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a very fancy story for public consumption, but the real story goes like this, that these, uh, these, uh, the founder was based in the city of San Francisco in USA. And uh, uh, one simple thing he realized was that outside these star hotels, uh, the Tridents or the, or the Hiltons and things like that. The, there are these uh, big limousine cars, big cars with the T symbol, which, which is the taxi symbol. Uh, there are a lot of them standing outside these hotels, ferrying passengers, supposedly ferrying passengers. Uh, on closer examination, these guys figured out that uh, uh, 90 to 95% of these cars are not owned by the hotel property. And these are leased out from fleet rental companies. Fleet rental companies are these taxi companies which let out their cars for use, uh, which means that uh, 90 to 95% of these cars are leased out to the five-star property. And on further examination, these guys realize that uh, 40 to 45% of the time, these taxis do not have passengers, which means that expensive asset is lying idle 40 to 45% of the times. Now, after have anybody who has invested in expensive assets would obviously not be happy keeping that equipment idle for 40 to 45% of the times. So uh, these uh, Uber founders, then created the famous app, the geolocation app, and went to these taxi rental or the fleet rental companies and said, and give them a proposition that if we give you passengers, when your cars are lying idle, would you take them? Now tell me who in their same state of mind would refuse such an offer. If my expensive asset is lying idle and if somebody comes and gives me an offer that you can monetize that expensive asset in that idle time, who would not uh, be happy to do it? So that's how they got their business. Uh, so fundamentally, what did they do? At a fundamental level, they actually identified somebody else's NVA, NVA meaning non-value adding asset. These cars were non-value adding assets for 40 to 45% of the time. Uber fellows identified somebody else's non-value adding asset and help them monetize that asset and in the process made money. Which means, can you find somebody else's non-value adding assets and help them make money and in the process make money? That's the basis of the, that's the fundamental principle uh, beneath Uber's, the uh, famous Uber's uh, business model. So try and identify if you can find some non-value adding assets lying idle in the environment that you are trying to create a venture in, trying to create a startup in, uh, and uh, see if you can help them monetize their non-value adding asset, and in the process, you will also make money. Uh, yeah. right. uh, now, because you are using somebody else's non-value adding asset, you can do business with zero inventory. I don't think this needs too much of an explanation. This naturally follows from the previous one. So let's see. Oh, this is another interesting one. Uh, this NetJets uh, is a company which, uh, which used to sell private aircrafts. Now who buys private aircrafts? Private aircrafts are obviously bought by super, super rich people. Uh, now for, for want of uh, defining these super, super rich people, uh, uh, I, will, I will call them as maybe super into 10 raised to 10 into rich. Suppose that's the category that we are talking about. Some really, really high profile business people, etc. They are the ones who buy an aircraft for their personal use, a private jet. Uh, so these guys, uh, NetJets uh, had this as their customer segment. Now, uh, 
after all, how many rich folks like that exist in the world? It's not a big market, right? It's a limited market. So after a point in time, NetJets was not able to grow the way they would have wanted to grow because it was a very limited market. So they wanted to look out for growth areas uh, and uh, they were generally trying to understand the uh, market segment that they were operating in. And they realized that uh, there is a segment which is slightly less rich than this 10, in, 10 raised to 10 into rich variety, say maybe super into 10 raised to 8 into rich variety. So they are slightly less rich, but phenomenally rich anyway. And these people are equally busy. Uh, they also need to uh, have an aircraft of their own because these also these guys are also super successful business. Uh, they cannot afford to wait for the timetable of commercial airlines. They need a private aircraft. But when they approach these people to sell a private aircraft, they found that these people were rich, but not so rich that they could suddenly take away some maybe, uh, you know, 30, 40 million dollars from their business and buy an aircraft for their own purpose. Uh, but there is, these guys realize that the need for these people for having a private aircraft existed, but they did not have the means to uh, uh, buy a private aircraft on their own. So they created another business model, NetJets created another business model and went to the same people that, okay, if you are not able to shell out the entire 100% of the money in one go, if we sell you an aircraft to a group of people like you, say five people like you, uh, and each one of you shells out, say somebody shells out 25% of the cost, somebody shells out 15%, somebody shells out 20%, somebody shells out 30%, totaling 100% of the cost of the aircraft. Uh, now finding such people was not difficult because there was that need for that aircraft, uh, for a private aircraft, but not everybody had the means to pay in one shot. So they sold that aircraft to these people as a group and each of them owned the aircraft fractionally, which meant that somebody owned 20% of the aircraft, somebody owned 15%, somebody owned 30%, et cetera. Uh, but as a group, they owned the whole aircraft. And the flying hours would be divided in the proportion of their investment in the aircraft across the year. Now that's how they opened up this market of 10 raised to eight into rich variety. But uh, there is a problem with this model because suppose two people from the same group want to fly at the same time. How does one solve the problem? That's a question that comes to mind. How does one solve that problem? Now, uh, these guys then started figuring out how to solve this problem because unless they solve that problem, this business model would not work. So then they realized that uh, NetJets would sell not just one aircraft to one group, but they would sell multiple aircrafts to multiple groups, say 300 aircrafts to 300 different groups. And each group has about five, six, five people or so. Uh, now, it is highly improbable that all 1500 people would want to fly at the same time, which meant somebody, some aircrafts would be empty, unused at some point in time, which means suppose two people have a clash in one group uh, to fly at the same time. One person can be given the aircraft that belongs to that group and the other person can be given an aircraft that belongs to another group, which means neither of them get hampered. Both of them are able to fly. But then the problem here is that uh, the person who has got another aircraft will suppose I am NetJets will come running to me and say, oh, you didn't sell me this aircraft. You sold me that aircraft. I will not take this one. Uh, this is breach of trust. So how does now NetJets solve the problem? These NetJets fellows said that uh, instead of buying separate different types of aircrafts for all these 300 groups, we will buy the same aircraft across all the 300 groups which meant that one person from that group who gets the aircraft belonging to that group 
the other person also gets the same aircraft, the similar aircraft, same brand, same internal, same everything, without any differences in standards. And then that problem gets solved. So these guys standardize the fleet. Now see how that fractional ownership at the front is getting analyzed at the back for creating better operations and smooth and efficient operations. Now, by standardizing the fleet, what are the benefits that uh, the, these NetJets fellows get? Obviously, when you standardize the whole fleet, uh, your bargaining power with the, uh, with the aircraft manufacturer goes up multiple times. Suppose 300 aircrafts are being, are being negotiated with one manufacturer, the kind of deal that they will get will be much better than negotiating with seven, eight different manufacturers for seven, eight different types of aircraft. So that's one straightforward benefit there. Secondly, uh, the maintenance of aircrafts requires pretty expensive spare parts. If you have a standardized fleet, the number of spare parts to carry would be much lesser. If you have seven to eight different types of aircrafts, then those many extra spare parts would have to be carried. So that their inventory holding cost of spare parts for maintenance purpose goes down dramatically. Uh, another benefit that they get is uh, the kind of manpower that they would employ. Imagine uh, there are two airlines uh, uh, with the same number of aircrafts. One has a standardized fleet and the other one has a non-standardized fleet. That means the say airline A, which has a standardized fleet, uh, will have to employ say X number of pilots, whereas for the same number of aircrafts, but with a non-standardized fleet, the airline B would probably have to employ 20% more pilots. Now, pilots are an expensive uh, asset, expensive uh, proposition. So. That means the salary costs are 20% higher for similar number of aircrafts for a non-standardized fleet as compared to a standardized fleet. So when NetJets standardized their fleet for fractional ownership for the 10 raised to 8 into rich category, they were able to economize on the costs as well. So fractional, fractional ownership is not just about selling it in fractions, but looking at the entire back end and really optimizing your operations and optimizing your costs. And obviously when you optimize your costs, your profits also go up. So moral of the story, when you're trying to sell something really expensive and uh, you can't find a single buyer for that particular thing that you're selling, maybe you should explore something like this, actual ownership kind of a model. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is uh, something like, uh, I call it platform creation. Uh, how do you create platforms for the products or services that you, that you are intending to manufacture? Let me take uh, one example of one of my students. Uh, his uh, product is called Smart Kheti. Smart Kheti uh, translates it, smart is smart in English. Kheti means farming, agriculture, farming. All right, so uh, smart agriculture is the literal translation of this word in English. This boy started off in 2013. Uh, yeah, 2013, late 2013, early 2014. This boy started off with a very, very simple product. Uh, his, one of his uncles, uh, two of his uncles were in the farming space and he would go to stay with them during his vacations, etc. And uh, he kind of figured out that, uh, you know, during his stay, uh, his uncle would all, every day have to get up at two o'clock or three o'clock in the night uh, to go and start the water pump in the fields because that's the time when the you know, the water cycle would start and things like that, cropping pattern, etc. So that's why you had needed to go wake up uh, at night and go. So this guy looked at this and created a very simple product, created an app on a mobile phone through which he could control the 
uh, motor pumps in the field, which means at the press of click of a button, one could put the uh, pump on and pump off, or you could set the timer, set the alarm or a timer, and it would go on automatically at two o'clock or three o'clock, wherever it would uh, be uh, required. Uh, which meant that the nightly visits of his uncle to the farm were completely eliminated. No rocket science here. And this was not a unique thing at that time. He kind of created it uh, iteratively. Uh, now, when he took this, when he wanted to sell this product in the market, he faced a lot of competition from already existing players. And him being a new, new player, uh, found it quite difficult to kind of... Uh, displays the entrenched large companies. One of the largest irrigation uh, equipment providers in India is a company called Jain Irrigation Limited. They are so well entrenched and they have the entire distribution network in their pocket. They don't let uh, competitors come into that space. The same problem this, this boy also faced. But this guy was kind of unfaced. He kept on visiting farmers, understanding more of their problems, and trying to create some better uh, features in their in his uh, platform to simplify their uh, problems and simplify their working, etc. So he was able to sell a little, but not to the amount that he would have dreamt. He he was thinking of. Uh, this boy did not give up. Uh, kept on uh, understanding more of problems. Kept on spending time with the farmers. And somewhere in 2016. Uh, when uh, the government of India uh, was looking at the subsidies which are given to farmers. Subsidies are in terms of waiver in electricity bills, waiver in water bills, etc. And uh, this, the new government which had come to power in 2014 wanted to really look at whether these subsidies were properly pinpointed or not. Earlier, subsidies would be given very blanketly to all farmers irrespective of the actual consumption of electricity and water at the farmer's farm. So this, uh, the new government which had come in, wanted to kind of make the subsidy distribution efficient. So they wanted to monitor the water consumption, electricity consumption, and various input consumptions for the farmers, and accordingly give away only that much subsidy that the farmer is entitled to. So they wanted to make that whole process more efficient. Now, this boy discovered this as an opportunity and started tracking all the parameters of consumption from the farmer's end and then went to the government saying that, see, this is the data that I've been able, I can collect from farmers if, and I will create a platform through which you can monitor the actual consumption and according to the consumption, the exactly relevant subsidy will be given to the exact relevant farmer. That means Customized subsidies, pinpointed subsidies were possible through his platform. He demonstrated his uh, proof of concept somewhere in 2016, 2017 to one of the state governments in India, got a pilot uh, order for about uh, 25 or 40 pieces on a trial basis, hardware along with the platform. Was the trial ran well. And today, uh, in 2000, from 2019-20 onwards, he gets uh, orders of about 15,000 pieces, 20,000 hardware pieces, uh, along with the platform from various state governments. So look at the growth story. Uh, now, what he has done is he has created a platform. He entered the market with a small little product, went to those farmers that were his customer segment and kept on studying what else could he do for them, what else could he do for them. And suddenly he created this platform which would enable capturing data and that data suddenly became very valuable for the governments for which he is getting paid quite handsomely today. And now he is further delving into the problems of the farmers. Another scheme from the government which came about, I think, in 2017 was that crop free crop insurance for farmers. Now, free crop insurance means, again, depending on the farm acreage, the kind of productivity of that farm, the kind of soil of the farm, the moisture level of the farm, that determines how much crop insurance should be allocated to that particular farmer. So this boy 
because he had created the platform, then tied up with other sensor manufacturers like soil quality sensor uh, monitor, uh, moisture content uh, sensors, etc. And through that platform, started collecting that data also and passing on to the relevant information to the government offices to be able to determine exact crop insurances that could be given to these people, which means he went into the market with his hardware, went to those customer segments, started understanding their problems, created a platform. And through that platform, he has now collaborated for other service providers also, but the platform is controlled by him. The access to that customer segment is completely through his platform. That creates a lock-in and with this kind of a lock-in, the larger competitor like Jain Irrigation also somewhere in the, in the areas that this boy operates in, they are out of the market. Uh, so this boy was able to bypass a strong competitor by creating a very, creating a very you know, direct or a unique kind of a platform. So by structuring his business in a different manner, he could have gone through the usual distribution channels like wholesale distributors, retailers, etc., and tried and banged his head against the wall without getting too much of, uh, of uh, traction. But he came back to the drawing board, recreated his, rethought his approach of going to the same customers and was able to create a penetration in that space. And now actually the larger competitor is slowly phasing out of the market because they don't have this platform and they don't have the lock-in with the government and the farmers. So that's a classic story of how one should think about creating platforms uh, and uh, scaling up. That's the way one scales up fast. And in the last 10 years, you will see companies which have created platforms, startups which have created platforms have scaled up uh, very, very rapidly. So think about how you can uh, get into thinking about platforms all right all right uh, how much time do we have another 15 minutes okay. hello how much time how much more how much time do we have ah sorry, sorry i was on, on mute i apologize we have about five minutes all right another okay five minutes okay then we'll take 20 i will end with this one this is an interesting one. Uh, you must have heard of the country called Samoa. Samoa is a bunch of 10, 15 islands somewhere between Australia and New Zealand on the Pacific Rim. You know? And uh, these guys had their uh, own uh, national airline called Samoa Air. And interestingly, they used to charge you by your weight. I'm not joking. They used to charge you by your weight. Uh, how they would operate is on their website, you could uh, book a ticket. Say, I'm booking a ticket for the next month on Samoa Air. They would ask me a question on the website. How much would you day, How much would you weigh on the day of the travel? That means, suppose I'm taking a flight on 15th of November. They're asking, they're asking me, how much will you weigh on 15th of November? I thought, it's, is it a joke? No, they meant, how much would you weigh and how much luggage would you carry? And accordingly, we will charge you. Suppose I book for 100 kgs, which is 75 kgs of my weight and 25 kgs of luggage. So I get a ticket. I swipe a credit card accordingly. 100 kgs multiplied by whatever their base fare is. And I get the ticket. And on the day of the travel, I go to the airport, go to the book uh, to get my boarding pass. Before giving a boarding pass, they would make me stand on a weighing scale along with my luggage. And if the total weight, say, exceeded 100, which I had booked, say it was 105 kgs, then they would, they would charge me for the 5 kgs extra, give me a boarding pass, and I go into the flat. If the weight would be less, say, 97 kgs, which means 3 kgs less than what I had booked for, they would give me a credit for those 3 kgs, which I could end cash on my next flight, which means they are actually charging us by as per what you use. This is pay for what you use, not pay per use. Now, these are interesting models uh, which are coming in in the service space. Uh, software as a service has been happening for the last 15 years. But in the product space also, this is going to happen. This is coming in now because 
Uh, now, if you understand that because of this corona pandemic situation, a lot of people have lost their jobs, a lot of people have taken pay cuts. So from on the consumer side, we are facing a consumer who is strapped of cash, doesn't want to spend as much money. So when you bring in pay for what you use models, you are going to actually reduce the cost of use for that customer. And how can you do it without really reducing the quality by maintaining the same quality, but by giving the customer by giving the customer a mechanism or a way in which he can use the same system, same product, but only for the time that he or she needs it, not otherwise. Now, there are these companies which have come up uh, about three, four years back. There is a company called Furlenco, F-U-R-L-E-N-C-O, which actually does this with furniture. They identified the segment of young professionals who move from one city to the other for jobs uh, because they keep on hopping jobs. And when they move houses, they move from one city to another city, they have to move their house. But if they have furniture bought by themselves, it's a very big pain to move the furniture from one city to the other. So they identified this pain point and came in with a model of furniture on rent good furniture on rent. You pay per month that you use it for. The furniture is not owned by the person. It is only used by the person and the person pays it per month. So that's what I mean by pay for what you use, even in the physical product space. And uh, these are the kinds of models that you really need to think of considering the fact that uh, customers today are strapped of cash. They don't want to spend as, mu mu as much money that they would probably have spent last year. They are facing cash uh, crunches. So think about all these kinds of things. Uh, let me end with uh, one uh, framework. Uh, a business has to satisfy user needs, has to make it technologically possible, whatever your solution is. And finally, it has to meet business goals. Unless you are able to do all these three, and you are in your position in this sweet spot, you're not going to remain sustainable. You may tackle user needs. You may figure out the technological possibilities to create the solutions. But if your business goals are not satisfied, your business is not going to remain sustainable in the long run. So when you think of creating winning business solutions, think of how you can be in this sweet spot, how your business model can be in this sweet spot, which takes care of all the three user needs, technological possibilities, and your business goals. That's where uh, I will stop. If there are any question answers, I can take them. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about uh, these traits of business models, uh, recently, four months back, I have just published a book uh, spe spe specifically about this topic. Maybe uh, if there are any questions, I can take them. Dr. Kastuk, thank you so much for such an insightful presentation. I think most of us, um, I, 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 I've, I've seen a part of, of this earlier on, I think last month, you just elevated from, from that first presentation that I attended. Uh, I think one of my the questions before they come in, one of the questions that I, I have is, you spoke about uh, the win and loss situation and spoke about the win-win. The as entrepreneurs, as young entrepreneurs and people who are trying to build uh, businesses, we find it extremely hard to strike that balance. How do we bring the win-win situation uh, without overly exhausting ourselves to try to meet, meet the needs of everyone? Uh, well, if you, you know, uh... Whatever you are doing, it, do it, whatever you are attempting to bring to the market, whatever idea that you're bringing to the market, uh, you cannot do it alone, right? You have to have backend suppliers, vendors who will supply you with material or other services. You will have some channel partners through which you will sell or through whom you will market, uh, market, the, market your product or service. Now, all these are 
the players in that whole eco ecosystem if you actually understand how they operate what are what are their pain points what are their pain areas if you understand those well enough and when you create your business model you need to take care of those pain areas and add some value to those people also and if you can add value to those people they will naturally come to you not go anywhere else so the most important point is mapping that ecosystem and understanding how each player is operating in that ecosystem and uh, identifying their pain areas and creating propositions which help those people as well normally when we think of businesses we think only of the customer only of the customer uh you need to think of the customer first yes but you cannot ignore the requirements of your other partners whether they are channel partners or your vendors how can you help everybody optimize is the approach that one needs to take um excuse me mr kalspar um is your book uh, can it be found in e libraries uh, school e libraries yes yes it's available on amazon in the hard copy version as well as the e copy version all right thank you very much okay okay any other questions i, I have one uh, which is selfish on my part i probably talk more about uh, something that you've just touched on in, a, in, 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 in earlier on but let me give it uh, one or two people a chance to um to maybe pose questions on you sure. the floor is all yours you can just raise your hand and i will see Okay, while we're waiting for for, for, for someone else, um, Dr. Kasup, you, 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 I, I like your idealism in terms of thinking, uh, uh, particularly with, with, with customer focus and customer speed. Now, a lot of businesses found, find themselves having to pivot due to many factors, one of them that is on our doorstep, which is the pandemic of Corona. Yes. Share with me your insight in terms of now, how do you uh, look, not necessarily for a new customer segmentation, but now make uh, your product or services appeal um, uh, for, uh, within the current circumstances that we found it in. I know you've touched uh, in a bit of what I'm asking, but I guess my question is, how, uh, is the how part? Yeah. One thing is, uh, you know, considering the pandemic situation, uh, if you are already in a business servicing customers, uh, first thing I think you need to look at is how can you convert your fixed costs into variable costs? Because mm. a lot of people uh, have gone out of business because they had huge fixed costs. So, so yes. first point number one, start thinking about that. And when you start thinking about that, maybe some pivots will come out. Uh, then another one I just, uh, just, I mean, I just touched here was uh, pay for what you use, right? If you are selling, if you pre-pandemic, if you were selling something, uh, uh, on the basis of I sell it now and that fellow pays me 100% right away. That, that was the model. But yes. can you convert it into something like pay for what you use? With, mm. with the use of, you know, how can you capture feedback on how it is being used? A little bit of some bit of uh, technology, not very fancy technology, but can you actually keep a track? Can you actually, as I talked about this furniture company, you know, instead of selling pieces of furniture outright, they started renting out furniture for that specific customer segment. So they were able to convert a fixed cost for the customer also into a variable cost. So yes. it is not just yourself for your business that you're converting your fixed cost into variable cost, but how can you convert the Acquisition cost of the, I mean, the customer acquires your product, right? So how can you convert that also into from a fixed to a variable cost? And if you can think on those lines, 
um, you know, a lot of pivots will uh, come out. Oh, fantastic. I thought that was my last question. Clearly, I lied. <laughs> no, <laughs> you, you, you just touch on something on something else on your, on your closing remarks right now. Look, um, the, the issue of design thinking is uh, closely attached to being innovative and obviously uh, and how we as startups or entrepreneurs think of, 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 of this. We typically think of hunger, then uh, let's produce on, on what we can at the moment. Yeah. With that in mind, so share with me or, or share with us, how do we get out of the mold of thinking about the current circumstances that we found find ourselves in, or the current um, system or strategies that we have on our businesses, so that we are future ready. And one of the colleagues had typed on the box when you had asked the question, "What do we think about innovation?" And uh, he, 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 they typed something that was very interesting to me. Uh, the education component of innovation. Yeah. Share with me, what are your thinkings in terms of that? And how do um, young entrepreneurs, well, by young, I mean early uh, business startups, people who are, have not much in, uh, strongly in, into business, which will speak about the, the pivoting that you earlier touched on as well. I mean, I would uh, say there is one fundamental principle that one should never forget that you are in the business because somebody is buying something that you're making. Hmm. All right. So keep that individual at the center of everything that you do. Hmm. Understand that user from all perspectives. If you understand the user, if you make that extra attempt to understand your consumer, you are always going to be kind of relevant to that customer. The moment you start thinking about that consumer, you might end up with a product which is not required by the consumer. So mm -hmm. the principal tenet of design thinking is that empathy with the end user. Increase your empathy quotient as a, as a business person. Uh, if your empathy quotient is high, you will always understand what your consumer is wanting without the consumer really telling what he or she is wanting. So yes. figure out techniques to understand how, how to understand the consumer and equip your team with the same set of skills. Uh, last time I had shared a, a, a document of about 27 different techniques of how do you understand consumers without really asking consumers, you know, observation, interaction, various methods. Maybe if that is there, you can circulate it amongst the audience if required, or I can send it again. So, and, and more than, and the entrepreneur founder himself or herself should be good at that. And please train your team also to be good at that. Yes, yes. Because that's important because uh, mm. you can't be present everywhere. But if you can empower your team to act like that, to behave like that, to have that mindset, I think you build a culture in the organization and the customer becomes the center for everybody in that organization. Kwanela, mm -hmm. you've raised your hand. Uh, I don't want to take up uh, uh, all the questions. Kwanela, go ahead. Um, hello, thank you so much. I uh, just have a question on consumer approach. Um, what would be your advice in terms of um, consumer focus approach versus individual specific approach? So in a, an organization where you are doing, for example, a validation test model, where either you want to create a bunch of t-shirts, mm -hmm. do you then still continue, especially with this economy, creating in mass uh, production or distribution so that you are um, giving out kind of like a, uh, a volume to uh, satisfy the consumers as a, in, a, in, a, in a large category, or do you then focus individually on different people within that um, 
uh, category? Like, how would you advise? There is there is a, a scope for either. I mean, in the mass category also, there are large players who play in the mass category, whereas there are uh, smaller players who play in the personalization category also. So, yeah, in India, there are these, you know, companies like Ink Fruit and uh, there was another one, a uh, US-based company called Threads and Needles, etc. They, they played in the uh, personalization category. Whereas these mass category are the Nikes and the Adidas of the world who create manufacturing mass. So, there is, there is business at both ends of the spectrum. Uh, but even for the mass manufacturers, they really need to understand what will sell. No? So they also need to understand the consumer trends, consumer habits. It's not that whatever the manufacturer will sell. Right? So on either side, you have to, there is no option but to understand your consumer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, thank you so much, everyone, for attending this session. I uh, am humbled by your contribution and your questions. Dr. Kastup, as always, uh, your insight it has extraordinary and invaluable change into how we do business as entrepreneurs. I thank you. And uh, on behalf of the foundation, I truly appreciate the time that you've given to us. To everyone, um, I, I say there's a number of people who actually want um, the document uh, around the 27 techniques um, uh, that can be used. Uh, if you can share that with me, um, yeah. I'll definitely share that with the attendees as well. Yeah, if you can just send um, me an email, I will respond to that. I don't have oh, your fantastic. Email. I don't have your email. Fantastic. I'll definitely do that. Yeah, I will. I will. Yeah. Yes. Everyone, good afternoon and uh, good evening to some. I think it's good evening to Dr. <laughs>